going to spend a lot of time talking about bills of material and cost of goods sold. We're passionate about building software that put those tools in your hands so that you've got a good feel for it. And then third, you know, more in-depth um, solutions like how do you actually pick a factory, put together a comprehensive quality plan, and then manage a um, project from once you've picked the factory through ongoing production. Uh, so that's a brief overview of us. Uh, we're based in uh, the U.S. and also China. We're always agnostic on where we build. The thing we care about is that our customers succeed and they understand how the process works. Um, mix of you know, really hardcore um, manufacturing engineers and also uh, a gifted software team to try to translate what we've built up over the last 10 or 15 years um, through experience and then get that into software. Uh, and on the next slide, we're really fortunate to work some, with some incredible companies from um, Pebble and Jibo um, through much larger companies like Shark Ninja and uh, Bose. But in general, it's companies focused on consumer electronics um, where they've got a prototype bill of materials and CAD files and are really looking to scale. Um, so just a little on us, um, you know, jumping into the meat of it, why is manufacturing hard? And what I thought here is a video is worth a thousand words. So what you'll see on the next slide was taken back in 2005 when I was at iRobot where I had the chance to spend 10 years uh, building the first 4 million Roombas. And I'm basically just running down the assembly line um, with a cheap camera trying to capture it. So it will go pretty quickly. Um, and we'll play that video now. So that will we'll play. Let's see if we can get it. Well, oh. Scott, we uh, we don't have the video capability on here. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, no no worries. Well, you can see there's a lot of workers. Um, there's a lot of manual labor involved. And sort of what I ask people to think about here is imagine that you were a group of say six or seven people that had designed something like the Roomba, um, and you're all of a similar background um, in terms of education and culture, um, and all based in the same area. And then you have to translate what you've built in sort of onesies, twosies, halfway around the world to a team of 5,000 people where you're building 40,000 units a week. And the design isn't stable, so it's changing all the time. Um, that sort of highlights some of the challenges that you, um, that you might face. And what we try to do on anything complex is to break it down into um, simpler pieces so that we can manage it. Um, to do this, we often use the framework of the manufacturing triangle. And this is three points, uh, cost, quality, and schedule. And uh, at least in consumer electronics, you have to get all three of them right if you want to succeed. Uh, what I'm obviously going to focus on today is cost, um, but you can imagine on um, the other two points, you could go um, you know, quite deep as well, and they're critical to actually bringing a product to the market. Scott, do quality and lead time impact cost? Yes. So, you know, we often think of quality. Um, one is just the um, how long does the product last for? Uh, and I often will use Aruba as an example, just because most people have heard of it, uh, and it's been in the you know been in the market for a while. But it's one thing to build a robot that lasts for 50 hours. But it's a very different thing to build a robot that's going to last for 5,000 hours in that you need, say, a lot better motors, you need better thermal management, stronger resins, and it just has to um, survive um, a lot longer in the real world. So definitely cost and quality are linked, but also quality and schedule and cost and schedule. So with quality and schedule, the longer you have something to the uh, longer you have to test a product, uh, presumably the more tests you can do and you'll get more confidence that you're building the, you know, a product that's going to be fit for use. In, um, in terms of cost and schedule, typically uh, for lower volume, product, uh, lower volume components, the cost is quite a bit higher. Um, you know, if you think of buying onesies or twosies uh, for a component, maybe it's a dollar. But then as you start buying in higher volumes, you know, maybe 5,000, 10,000 units, there's this concept of volume step pricing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And that component, instead of costing a dollar, might cost 70 cents. 
and that, that curve tends to continue. So all three points of the triangle are very closely connected, and uh, that's definitely an excellent question. Uh, you know, it, we had talked a little bit about in the beginning uh, how the process works in terms of different volumes. And here I've got a, you know, just a picture of it. And what we find is that most hardware startups, and even larger companies for that matter, are going to start on the left where they'll build one unit. And often, if you look at it mechanically, uh, it's the proverbial um, popsicle sticks and hot glue. They'll get some confidence that it works, and then they'll build 10, maybe using 3D printing, and again, iterate the design, and then build 100 um, by machining it, and then soft tooling it, and then eventually hard tooling it. And the same progression holds for um, ele electrical and software as well. The thing that we find that's common across all of these sort of different steps that you go through uh, and is really foundational is the bill of materials. Um, so that's where we always focus. And uh, if you're going to sort of overlay on top of this transition from one to many a risk curve where risk is on your y-axis and the amount of money you need to spend on, is on your x-axis, you see something pretty horrifying in that the risk goes up as you spend more money up to a point and then hopefully you'll get uh, the recipe stable and then the risk will be reduced. So what I'd like to do today is through this be able to give you some techniques to be able to make that curve more friendly so that you can um, have a good strategy for your risk management. And again, kind of looking at the bomb is the, um, the foundation on which you'll um, build your product. Now, one of the things we had touched on is, you know, why is a bomb important? And for one, it's a great way to keep control of your intellectual property or your IP. I know from firsthand experience when we were doing the first Roomba, we were going so fast that we would often rely on the factory to make late stage tool changes. So you can imagine, you know, maybe 9 or 10 o'clock on a Friday night, the thing isn't working, you give the tool back to the factory, they throw it on the uh, bridge port, and uh, machine in a few ribs, none of which are captured in the database or the bill of materials. And if you take that and multiply it, uh, not only mechanically but electrically, across a couple months if not longer, you've got a lot of changes that aren't recorded. And as a result, you become really beholden to the factory so that it's very difficult to switch if you want to later. So you give up all sorts of uh, leverage in terms of pricing or uh, things like that. Whereas if you keep your bomb current, then you always stay in the balls of your feet and are very nimble uh, and can um, you know, maintain good control of the factory. So that's an example of sort of the system of record and IP. Uh, cost of goods sold is another critical thing. So COGS or cost of goods sold is typically how much you have to pay the factory to buy the product. And this will determine you know, in many ways whether you succeed or fail as a business. Uh, so with a good, well-founded bomb, you can calculate the cost of goods sold. Um, and we'll dive into some of the other um, uh, uh, plans mentioned around the rim here. Uh, so why don't we jump in with a, a poll, and I'll, I'll let you uh, kick that off. Uh, so everybody, so um, people are, some, a lot of people who have even done hand builds are you know familiar with the idea of a bill of material that's you know it's like a shopping list right you have some things that are off the shelf some things that you have to make by 3d printing machining or molding so what kind of tools are people using now to manage your bill of material uh, i see excel being the top one uh, there are some people using arena uh, oracle other plm software and I even see two pen and paper. And I'm very curious what the other is. <laughs> Scott, what is the major difference between uh, Excel and using dedicated PLM software? Sure. Yeah, so this is a great, uh, this is a great poll. And it definitely mirrors our experience that you know, pretty much everybody starts in Excel just because it's so easy to use and it's free and everybody has it. Um, and that's absolutely a great way, you know, when you're building really low volume to start recording what's in your bill of materials. As you get up into more functional um, 
product um, lifecycle management or PLM software, software, then it tends to add a lot more features. So things like inventory planning, um, the ability to do hierarchical bombs where you can keep track of different sub-assemblies and then roll them up. Uh, volume step pricing. So as we talked about in the beginning, the price of one component bought on its own is often different than if you buy 5,000 of them. And pretty quickly that becomes very difficult to do in Excel. Or if you do manage to pull it off, you have to build a lot of the functionality yourself. And then you get a spreadsheet that you know goes out to the double, um, double letter columns. So it becomes really unwieldy quickly. So good PLM software will let you keep track of that. The challenge that we see, uh, having done this for a long time and actually having lived it firsthand, I know when I was at iRobot, we went from pretty much spreadsheets um, and then jumped straight up into Oracle and Windchill, which are really heavyweight, insanely capable um, PLM software. But the, <laughs> the downside of it is they're extremely expensive. And for us, progress stopped for about a year. It was just impossible to do the simplest thing. So those are great if you're Apple or you know, moving really high volume. But um, what we find is companies need a really nice um, sort of intermediate solution before they jump into that because they still need to be super fast. They need more um, sort of knowledge. Uh, you can think about lighting the path to go from the prototype to production than you can find in Excel, which is just a, a vessel. And we can talk a little bit more about some of the, um, some of the options kind of in that space between Excel and uh, the heavyweight PLM. Great, thank you. Cool. So, yeah, why don't we just start by defining what a bill of materials or a bomb is? And at its most basic definition, it's just a list of ingredients that go into making your product. Um, the thing is, it needs to include all of the all of the ingredients. So, uh, it's the combination of the electrical and the mechanical, but it also includes things like packaging, master carton, the amount of tape that you need to seal the carton instruction ma uh, manuals, poly bags, wire ties, uh, you know, the true, uh, true list of ingredients uh, that actually go into to building your product. And with each one of those, you can imagine they'll have some description. So if it's a capacitor, you'll specify the footprint and um, tolerances and so on. Um, but with this, then a factory should at least know what to order to build the, to build the product. We often will um, look at it in a hierarchical um, standpoint. So you'll, um, and you can look at it a few different ways in terms of the hierarchy, but one would be breaking it down into electrical, mechanical, purchased, um, and packaging parts. Another would be breaking it down into the sub-assemblies. So imagine you've got a Roomba, a couple of virtual walls, and a charger. Um, each of those would have their own bomb and then they would um, be part of the overall bomb that goes into building the product. Um, so depending on what you're doing, you may want to look at it um, through different lenses. But again, the end of the day, the bomb is just basically the ingredients that you need to, um, to build your product. And uh, why don't we jump to a poll here? So, you know, as we think about, um, I mean, I would imagine a bunch of folks on um, the webinar have, you're building stuff, you already have bombs. Uh, it'd be great to understand how you think about the health of your bill of materials and also its completeness. Could a factory actually build the product um, based on the info in your bomb and would it be easy for them to, um, to do? So let's take a look at the results here. We're seeing kind of this is almost a simplified bell curve, right? <laughs> Most people think somewhere in the middle, and some people think they need help. So hopefully, Scott will give us some good tips on organizing the bomb. <laughs> I will do my best. Yeah, and this definitely mirrors as we talk with folks in the ecosystem. Uh, it's very consistent with what we see out there. So, you know, let's get into a little bit more detail as to what to actually include in the bomb. And I've broken this down um, sort of by um, category of part. So uh, basically, again, you want to give enough instructions so that a factory can build your product. 
the um, you know just picking on some mechanical ones, and I, I won't go through these in detail. We can distribute the slides later. But things like what is the fabrication uh, method you're using, and by this I mean is it injection molded or die cast or roto molded or stamped or machined, um, because that's important as they start setting up their line to know what sort of equipment they need. Uh, what's it made out of? Is it ABS, polycarbonate, uh, and alloy of the two? Uh, how big is it? Uh, so the basic um, information that you can imagine actually being on the other side and receiving a bomb from somebody you haven't met before. And uh, if it's done well, you'll have enough information to be able to go and prepare the manufacturing line. The, we like to use analogies of dragons. So sort of the um, way we'll often think about it is using the hamburger analogy, where imagine the thing you built is the burger. And then the burger consists of these different parts. So say the buns are a fabricated uh, component. And that might be something like your injection molded part or a stamped part. Uh, then often you'll have some purchase parts. So these are like screws, um, uh, springs, things like that, uh, maybe batteries. Um, many things we build have electronics. So you'll have what we call a PCBA, or printed circuit board assembly which consists of the bare board or the PCB, and then all the electrical components that are assembled on that, so resistors, capacitors, processors, uh, and memory. Um, but you can sort of use the burger as an analogy for what you're building. And then when you go and buy a burger, they just don't hand you a greasy burger over, um, over the counter, but you actually need packaging um, uh, you know, to make it um, is safe in the journey from the server to you. You may get some fries and accessories along with that. And then all that stuff is wrapped up in an overall, um, overall box, which we often call the master curtain. And its job is to survive shipping and keep the gift box um, safe and prevent it from getting scuffed up. And these are all things that you need to build your product, and they should all be represented in the bill of materials so that the, uh, the factory knows to go ahead and order them. Now there's um, basically three key concepts that are not well understood and we often see messing up hardware companies. So I wanted to spend a little time uh, jumping into those. And these are specifically as you go from uh, you know, low volume to higher volume. And one is this concept of minimum order quantity or MOQ. And uh, the way I describe it is imagine you wanted to drink five ginger beers it's probably cheaper to buy a six pack and have one left over rather than um, buying six individually. So again, getting at the idea of volume step pricing. But where it gets a little bit tricky is that on your bomb, uh, you will want to call out what MOQ and the price is, but you're going to have one left over, which is your overage. And you need to keep track of that because you ideally will fold it into future production, but you also have to pay for it. And from a cash flow standing, uh, cash flow planning standpoint, if you don't keep track of it, it's going to be expense um, that you hadn't counted for. And this starts to get tricky if you have 200 items on your bomb. They all have different minimum order quantities, and uh, and you've got a lot of overages because that can jack up your price significantly. So you want to be cognizant of that and track that. The next one is the lead time. So often if you order from Premier Farnell or DigiKey or Mauser, um, you know, you'll get the part you need overnight in low, low volume. But as you switch to higher volume, then a crazy thing happens. And that's if the lead time goes from one day to often 12 weeks. And this is where we get into the manufacturing uh, triangle again, cost, quality, and schedule. If you're trying to hit the holiday season or imagine you're shooting for CES or Mother's Day or Father's Day or you know, whatever the key um, schedule milestone is, if you haven't accounted for the lead time, you can find yourself either really compressed on the uh, amount of time you have to run uh, quality testing or having to airship it instead of sea ship it, which takes a lot more cost, or just having to pay a higher price for the lower MOQ products, all of which are suboptimal. So it's really, really critical to keep track of your lead time. And often every component has a slightly different lead time. Uh, some of them will even jump into like six months of lead time. So if you can, as you're looking at your bomb, um, be able to analyze it ahead of time and say, oh, instead of using component A, there's another one that's footprint compatible that I can cross it with and use that one instead. 
um, I'll have a lot less uh, lead time to deal with. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing in your BOM is uh, procurement. And there's basically four ways that you can specify um, that a factory buy your product. The first is consigned. And in that case, you would actually buy it and provide it to the factory. And the reason it's important to call this out is, one, uh, so the factory knows not to buy it so you don't get too many of them. And then two, typically for any consigned good, you'd want the factory to assign a lower markup to that um, just because they're doing less work and you don't want to pay them for it. It's also a great way to protect your IP to make sure that the factory doesn't run a ghost shift, which is basically them running your line at night and then selling the product, which is not counterfeit. It's actually your product selling that into the market. Um, so by doing consigned um, components, and typically you just want to do one, uh, it's usually your processor, um, that's, that's critical to call out. Next thing is what's called an ABL or approved vendor list. And this would be for um, imp components that are important, you may qualify four or five vendors and say, okay, I don't care which one of these vendors you use, but it's got to be one of these. Um, and that's important so the factory knows not to make substitutes without your uh, permission. If there is only one vendor that you've assigned, um, that becomes your assigned vendor. And that means that the factory can only use that part from that vendor. Otherwise, they have to get your permission. And then finally, for generic, that's typically resistors and capacitors. And uh, there, if your design is stable enough and can handle the tolerances, you typically don't, um, you don't care what they use as long as they're within spec. And you'll call out generic. Um, so it, again, it's critical in the bottom to be very clear as to which one of the four types of procurement you're expecting on a component level. Because otherwise, when you don't do that, the factory is likely going to substitute in lower cost components over time, often without telling you. And it's not that they're trying to be evil. Um, it's just uh, that they're looking to improve their margins as much as they can. And that's a good way to do it. Um, so this way you can be very clear. And again, uh, if you remember that screenshot of the video, it all comes down to communication. So this is a way to be effective there. Uh, so just giving you um, a couple tools. One, um, you know, the Excel is a good way to start. There's a, a better way within the um, Google add-on store. We've created this thing called the Dragon Standard Bomb, which is free. And it's basically just, um, you could think of it like a template on steroids. So it has all of the right headings so that you can um, know that you're um, including the right data so that when a factory or uh, one of your partners sees this, they're going to have the, the data in a format that's familiar to them. And that's a great way to get started. Um, as you think about scaling production, then uh, we'd mentioned in the beginning uh, many companies take the jump from Excel to uh, PLM tools. And as we also mentioned, there's often a really big gap between what you can do in Excel and jumping into something like Oracle, where you know I think at iRobot when we put it in, it was a couple million bucks, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, and it cost us a year just getting familiar with it. Um, so eventually that's an awesome thing. We find um, just in a gap that exists, there's an opportunity. So we built a product called Product Planner, um, which will basically let you do things like hierarchical bills of material that you can flatten, keep track of volume step pricing. Um, it's got a button, so if you have an MFN or manufacturer part number um, for your electrical components, they'll automatically cost it out for you. Um, so it's sort of in the middle between Excel and uh, PLM. And if you're interested, check it out. What's the um, and I'll jump into actually what's more interesting in terms of what you can do with the data when you have it. But uh, what would be great is, you know, just as you think about working with factories, to take a poll for what you see as the greatest challenge that you have um, working with your, with your factories here. And by the number of responses here, that's awesome. That uh, uh, sounds like a lot of people are building, um, building product, which is, which is fantastic to see. It looks like the one that's bubbling to the top is finding the right CM. And that's great to see. And again, it does mirror what we see. Uh, we know that the most important decision that you'll make that will directly influence the success or lack of success of your product is picking the right uh, factory. And there's probably 20 or 30 different criteria you could look at, which, um, which would be a topic for a different day. 
but, uh, but it's good to see the importance people uh, put on finding the right partner. And definitely not every um, – it, it's a very – it's almost – we think of it like dating or getting married. You know, not everybody's right for everybody else, um, but it's really a unique bond that you'll find um, as you find a great factory. So good to go through that in a very thorough um, – uh, have a thorough process around it. Okay, so let's see. Let's say you've got your bill of materials updated. Um, it's complete. You're feeling good about it. Now let's dive into some of the cool things you can do with it. So there's many different um, ways to analyze it, but the one I uh, figured I'd focus on here is looking at your cash flow. And what we've seen is that the leading cause of startup death or death of any company is running out of money. And the problem is that many companies run out of money, but they don't realize it's happening until it's too late. Uh, namely, they've bought a bunch of inventory, and then they start to get ready to scale, but realize that they don't have the working capital to enable that. But they're not so far enough along that they can get a bank loan or they can um, get factoring to buy their inventory. So uh, something that's amazing, you want to grow, can actually um, be the end of you if, if you haven't thought through your cash flow ahead of time. And the other challenge, just given the lead times that I mentioned, is that uh, often, you know, if you're looking three months out, if you don't have sufficiently good terms with your factory or your retailer, it's very difficult to change those later, but you don't realize it for quite a while, and in fact, until it's too late. So, you know, let's just jump into a simple example here. Um, so I've got my bill of materials with all my lead times and MOQs and so on. And based on that data, uh, and this is just an output from Product Planner, we've got a representation where time is on the um, x-axis. So zero is picking the factory, and then it goes all the way through shipping. Um, the red bars going down and uh, up the y-axis is cost is um, the checks you have to write. So you know, initially you have to pay 50% of your tooling up front. You may have to prepay for some long lead components and so on. And then the green is the revenue, which is an awesome thing that you get from selling the product um, either to this channel or your end customer. And then if you look at it, gray graphically is the cum diff between the two of them. So what we can see from this is what our working capital requirements are. In this example, about a quarter of a million dollars. And we can also see that we're profitable um, because the tail end of the gray is above the, um, above the axis. You know, a lot of these we run in the grays below water, and, you know, it's nice to know that ahead of time. It's typically for one of two reasons. You're either selling a product for less than it costs you to make, um, in which case the more you sell, the more bankrupt you're going to go. Or you just have a lot of tooling and fixed costs that you have to pay off. Um, so there you want to sell as many as you can, but it's important to know which one of those you're looking at. Um, and with this figure also, it includes things like your – tooling, your scrap, your overage, uh, any NRE you have, and so on. Um, that's all kind of factored into this plot. And what I've done is just pulled out four uh, key variables. So component terms mean, you know, what do you have to, or when do you have to pay the factory for the component? What I've modeled here is you have to pay the factory 100% of the component cost when you order it. So in simple terms, let's say you had a 12-week component you'd have to pay the factory 12 weeks ahead of when you ship the product for that. The CM terms are when you pay the factory. So what it's set here is X factory, um, meaning you pay the factory when you take delivery of the goods. And then your customer delivery is they pay you 30 days after they get it, and then we're going to see ship. And what I'll do is just step through sort of as a um, keyframe animation. And you can look at by changing the MAR, and I'll toggle back and forth here, you can see by paying, um, instead of 100% up front, paying when you ship the product, it means you have to deploy your cash for less amount of time because there's less weight on the gray. Um, and then if you were to say, all right, well, instead of paying my factory when I receive the goods, if I could pay them net 30, that's going to have an um, impact on the amount of cash I need in terms of working capital. And then instead of getting paid 30 days after I deliver the product to my customer, what if they paid me when they received it? That's going to have a massive impact on the working capital. And then finally, if you airship instead of cease ship, um, it moves your revenue to the left. So basically, we've been able to go, just stepping back from this picture, uh, 
to this picture, which is much more favorable. You went from a quarter of a million dollars to under $100,000 of working capital. And you're able to do this without changing your design one bit. You know, clearly, if you improve your design, then there's additional opportunities for savings. But what this lets you do is as you get those big orders um, and you're ready to scale, you need a lot less cash in the business. So you either end up raising less money, so you keep more ownership, or you can scale faster. Um, and these are all things you know, directly drive from, derived from the bill of materials data, um, as well as the overage scrap uh, markup and so on. Um, and it's all possible you know, with, the bill, with the bill of materials. Yeah, it sounds like there's a question. At what point can we do this kind of forecasting with Product Planner? Is it required that we have tooling quotes, et cetera, from factories? Mm, yeah, so you can do it today on uh, Product Planner. And basically, if you have a um, – we keep track of tooling, NRE, compliance, which would be like FCC, CE, um, and then product development costs, you know, pretty much any fixed costs you have. You could either put in the actual binding quotes, or what we find is really effective is just putting in a placeholder. So you may look at it and be like, well, you know, I need 60K of tooling-ish. Um, Let me just put that in. And then as you, you know, continue to iterate, maybe you get some quotes back from factories. You can tighten that up. But it's really helpful from a planning perspective, um, even if the data isn't exact, to have it in there, um, just to get a feel for what that curve looks like. Do you have any recommendations on reading materials or tools to help estimate tooling costs? Mm, sure. So the, there's a couple ways to do it. What we've done at Dragon is just built up our own model so we can look at a part and then estimate what the tooling cost would be. There's, um, and we do it sort of empirically, so it's going to be more of an estimate. There is a company um, – called a priori that will do a very detailed analysis um, and it, 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 they're all, um, their software you have to buy. I don't think they have a, a trial. Um, and I, I would recommend them for like big tools you know, if you're spending a lot of money, but it may not be the best use of capital right off the bat um, as, as you ramp up. Um, but yeah, it's one of those areas outside of those two or talking with people or looking at comparable parts, it is a little bit difficult to get the data. Terms, do startups have enough negotiating power to uh, negotiate net 30 versus net 90? Right. So, you know, the thing that uh, helps in manufacturing is volume. Um, the factories typically want to move or make as many um, units as they can. So, initially, you don't really have any leverage other than the hype around your product and your team and what the factory thinks of as a potential. So if you're building a commodity part, it's probably very difficult to get anything better than next, um, zero or X factory off the bat. But if you're a venture-backed company doing the next Roomba um, and the factories are competing for your product, then I think it's, it's very feasible to get net 30. What we typically find is companies are somewhere in the middle. And what we would recommend is on your manufacturing service agreement, which is basically your contract with the factory, you lay out um, a plan where for the first 10,000 units you pay them you know, net zero, and then as we get up into you know, the next um, 10,000 units, maybe it moves to net 10, and then you keep escalating from there. It's also possible to work with distributors. We're huge fans of the, um, of the Avnet guys, and um, Many distributors will give uh, great financing terms because it's often the electronic parts that drive the majority of the cost. So if you were to work with them, um, they might, or um, and there's many great distributors out there. Uh, that would be a good conversation to have to see if they can extend um, terms on that, so you have less cash uh, tied up. Cool. Well, so what I've done so far is sort of giving you a high-level look at why the bomb is important and some of the reports that you can um, run out of it. What I'll do in the remaining time we have together is dive into the cost of goods sold and talk through some strategies on both how to understand it at a very detailed level and then how to reduce the costs. So uh, in terms of definitions, 
um, what we think of when we say the cost of goods sold is really just the cost to build the product. It doesn't include tooling, compliance, NRE, um, any of that stuff. Uh, the one that we typically focus on is what's called X Factory or um, XF, and that is uh, the price you would pay the factory to take ownership of your product. Now, there's different um, types of COGS depending on where it is in the logistics journey. So you could also look at it as FOB, which is basically the X Factory price plus the overland transportation price to get to the boat or landed, which would add to that the cost of shipping it across the Pacific or wherever it is, or um, the, the finally the delivered cost, which is actually what it costs to get it all the way to the customer. And all of them are, you can refer to any of them, it's just important that you're specific as to which one you're talking about. And again, we usually just refer to the X Factory because that's what we can control. Now the price is going to vary based on a few things. One is, as I mentioned with the room, but typically designs are not stable, so you're always improving them. And it might be, um, you know, trying to get uh, it uh, based on what you've learned, or it may be more orderly and sustaining engineering where you improve the quality and reduce the cost. Um, but typically every product um, within batches is, is a little bit different. So you want to make sure you line that up to the cost. And then there's also um, pressures like the commodity pricing. So, uh, for example, plastic or resin is driven uh, is made primarily of oil, and as we know, oil goes up and down. So it would depend on when they bought the the resin and what the oil prices are. Um, uh, so you just want to be clear, and ideally, you can tie a particular unit to a particular bill of materials and get costing on that. Um, but that's just an overview in terms of what design, uh, what drives the cogs. Uh, there's a lot of um, different factors um, that are either grouped by your design or the manufacturing partner. And I'll focus today more on the manufacturing um, partner side. But the biggest one we find is how transparent they are. So you can imagine two bills of material. One is for a given unit, it says that it's just one number. Let's say it's $10. And then the other one is uh, COGS broken down to very detailed level, um, you know, line by line, but within each line, um, a lot of details around the, how the, the part is actually manufactured. Um, and what we find is the more detailed um, the factory will break down the, um, the COGS, the, the more fair the pricing is, and also the better visibility you have so you know where all the money is flowing and what to focus on. Um, so for us, bomb transparency from the factory is a, um, is a really big driver. Scott, would you if advocate we, for working with a CM that provides transparency on their internal costing? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know of any CM that's going to let you see the invoice of what they actually paid for the part, um, but we're huge advocates of what we call open book pricing so that they at least will tell you how much they're charging for each part. Okay. And, the, um, and we'll definitely dive into that um, in a few minutes, but the um, punchline is you want your bill of materials to be mathematically driven so that there's formulas and at the end of it, it ends up with one number that you understand how you got to that number as opposed to just a factory saying, oh, hey, Scott, it's 10 bucks um, because that really tells me nothing. I don't know if I'm getting a fair price or not. And I should also point out it's really important the factories make money um, because if they don't, then they're not going to be motivated to work with you. Um, and by getting a transparent bomb, you can make sure that they're making a reasonable amount of money, not too much, not too little. Whereas if you just have a lump sum, they're probably making too much money um, and you don't even know what knobs to turn to reduce the COGS. Good advice. Thank you. Oh, cool. That was a great question. Um, so what I've got in the next two slides is just a quick um, price breakdown um, model. And I've been focusing on COGS. Uh, which includes the materials, as we talked about, accessories, um, labor, um, profit, and markup from the factory. But then layered on top of that, getting it all the way to the customer are the distribution um, costs. If you're working with a channel like Best Buy um, or the Apple Store, they need to make money, so their um, gross profit has to be factored in there. And also, you have to make money, so your profit or your GM um, has to be included. And then there's things like um, shipping costs, um, warranty, insurance, and so on. 
Um, so the sale price can be quite a bit higher, and it should be quite a bit higher than the cost of goods sold, just to make sure it's a profitable business. The other side of it is these non-reoccurring engineering costs, or NRE. And these are typically not captured in the BOM and not part of your X factory price. Um, but they can be sizable, and they're really important to keep track of. Uh, and I think this is where a lot of companies fall short, that they use Excel for the BOM, but they don't have a way to capture these. They forget about them, and they run out of money. So you know, just looking at some things on this stack, uh, engineering support to take your design and get it to uh, DFM, or Design for Manufacturer um, State, uh, is going to cost money. Tools, so the big um, you know, metal tools that you might use for injection molding, um, you know, typically can run anywhere from $20,000 to $1 million, depending on what you're building. Um, as part of the pre-manufacturing process, you're going to run a bunch of pilot samples. Uh, so you have to account for those costs. And then on the quality side, typically on the line, you'll have a, best, a bunch of fixtures. Whereas you build a subcomponent, you want to test that to make sure it works before you, you know, build it up into the final um, product. And those all have costs associated with them. Um, so there are quite a few costs that you want to keep track of. The way that we recommend being able to control it, as I talked about, is really pushing for transparency. So deconstruct the bomb into the most basic uh, of elements. And the way we would suggest doing this is don't rely on the factory to give you a price or um, a price bomb, but give them a bill of materials in the format that you want with fill in the blanks, so that you can break it down line by line, and then have them specify what each component costs, and then just wrap the associated formulas around it, or use a tool like Product Planner um, to keep track of it. Uh, one of the important techniques we found is that for many components, the way, um, or actually the, the way a bomb works in terms of going from a bomb to a cost of goods sold is you have the material cost. So let's imagine these are the um, boards and springs and screws and plastic. Um, and then you've labor because you've got to pay the workers to put it together. And to get to the cost of goods sold, you basically add the two of those together and then multiply by our markup. So for a simple example, let's say you got 50 cents of material, 50 cents of labor, and your markup is 15%, then your X factory price would be 50 plus 50 is a dollar times 1.15 is a dollar 15. Um, so as you think about that, you might say, well, shoot, I've got some electrical components that are going to run 20 or 30 bucks, you know, if you've got an expensive radio in there. And I don't want to pay the, the factory 15% you know, of that, because they're not really doing that much more work. And if you thought this, you'd be exactly right. So what we recommend is separating components less than a certain threshold and having the factory apply a markup to that, and then use a different um, threshold for components, a different markup for components that are above the other threshold. Um, so in this case, for the radio, instead of getting a standard 15%, you might be able to negotiate with them either a lower percent or a fixed cost. And it's usually the high ticket items, so like radios, memory, batteries, uh, antennas, and so on, that you want to separate the special components. And then by doing this also and getting this transparency, if you're fortunate enough to have a database, you can make sure that the price you're getting quoted from a factory is in line with, uh, with the market. Um, but the key thing there is that um, very molecular level of your bill of materials. What I'll walk you through in this slide is just how to calculate the cost for a plastic component. So I, I just picked a gear as an example. And many people often ask, you know, geez, a gear is a, a precise piece of um, uh, a molded component. Does it, does it matter? Are they going to charge more for that? And, you know, in some ways, uh, it will cost a little more, but maybe not in the way that you think. So the way that we specify um, how plastic cost is, we start with the material cost, so specifying whatever grade resin uh, you're using for that, and understanding what the volume is of the part, so that if you um, do some simple math, you can figure out how much um, resin you actually need to build the component, and you know what the resin costs. Um, so that gives you your material component. And then the other part of it is the overhead of converting that resin into a gear. And 
in this case, we're injection molding it. So there's a um, cost of running whatever ton press you need, and then also a cycle time for how many uh, gears the press can pump out every hour. Um, and by working through the math there, you can figure out what the overhead per gear is. Now, the reason it matters that it's a gear as opposed to a housing or something less precise is that for a gear, you're probably going to design the mold differently, that it's going to have a slower um, cycle time, so the overhead will be a bit greater, and also the gating will be done differently, so you'll probably have a little bit more regrind or a little bit more scrap. But it all comes down to the fundamentals of how much material do you need and what's the overhead. And then, as I mentioned, um, with everything, you have to apply a markup on it. So effectively, the cost of the part is the material plus the overhead. Um, and then adjust it for the markup. And with, uh, with this um, technique, you can figure out what any plastic part costs. So you get a really good feel for it ahead of time, as opposed to having to wait for a factory to uh, quote you on it. Uh, what I've got on the next slide, and the link's down there if you're interested, is just the um, price trend of different resins. Um, as a function of time. And as I mentioned, um, resins are made from oil, and oil goes up and down, so these prices tend to vary a little bit. Uh, but you can see here in terms of uh, US dollars per ton for different resins. So ABS is typically used for housing. Uh, POM is used for gears. Um, PC or polycarbonate is used for impact um, resistant parts or um, optical components. So based on the formulas in the previous slide, you could fill in the blank for the resin price. And then on the next one, I've got some examples of what the overhead is for running um, molding machines or, you know, and injection presses. Um, so with this stuff um, and some simple math, you should be able to calculate you know, when any uh, plastic part in your volume cost. The electrical components well, are, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, we have about three minutes left. So I'll ask you one more question okay, from, the from the audience. Oh, cool. If the product if the is product with no uh, should the, you know, is uh, China still the best place to manufacture? Mm, yes. So, you know, we've never had a problem losing any IP in China. Um, but said another way, um, I don't think the geography matters as much as the process of selecting a great factory. And then we're really big fans of having feet on the ground embedded in the factory. Um, and there's a whole IP strategy that you could use uh, to even protect yourself further. Um, definitely the, the bomb is one of the most important pieces of IP, so you wouldn't want to send that out um, without knowing who's on the receiving end and making sure that they're a trusted partner. With a factory, it gets tricky in that for the RFQ, you want to expose enough information to them so they can give you an accurate cost, but not so much that they could go and steal your product and build it without you. Um, so it's always finding the right, um, the right balancing act. Thank you. Cool. And realizing we're um, finishing up here, um, I wanted to share some typical margins. And these are just PRC is China typical Chinese margins from you know, sort of the low six to eight if you're building um, populated boards all the way to over 40% uh, uh, if you're building medical products. Uh, so again, this is what you would apply to the sum of labor plus the components. Um, as we talked about, um, transparency is important. One area the factory is always going to add extra fat is on their labor rate. So as you're looking at it, they should always call out labor separately, and then that was a great area to ask some questions to explain why, why the labor is as high as it is. And then finally, you know, just finishing up, I wanted to leave you with some resources, um, additional talks on um, you know, how to pick factories and go through that to some of the tools we talked about. And uh, I think with that, given we're about um, an hour in, I'll um, stop and always happy to answer questions. Um, anytime and, and love talking about manufacturing. And a huge thank you to the Fictive team for uh, allowing us to, uh, to participate. We really thank you, Scott, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, I mean, manufacturing is something a lot of design engineers are unfamiliar with. And uh, we hope to do another webinar in the future to make dive into uh, uh, estimating profit margin, and some of the other things that came during this webinar.
Fantastic. Well, have a great day, everybody, and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you.